Hey guys, I'm Chris. Welcome to A Glimpse Inside. Today, we're going to take a look at how we made a sliding barn door bar holding not one, but two refrigerators. The process goes from here to there to here to finally this. And the process was awesome and the result. Stay tuned to check it out. This project started out like no other. Pen and paper, get an idea, go from there. Now, there's nothing real glamorous about what I'm doing here. I'm simply just milling down my sheet goods, getting the three quarter inch Baltic birch plywood to the lengths and widths I need to build this cabinet. At this point, I'm tacking it in place, making sure it's kept square. I go ahead and tack on the middle piece and I come back and reinforce every joint with glue and screws. These two pieces are clamped together and cut at the crosscut sled. They're gonna be at the top of the cabinet. They're gonna be at the front and the back and they're gonna tie this whole thing together. I rip a piece of one quarter inch plywood down. It's gonna be the back of the unit. It's cut to rough dimension and I tack it in with some three quarter inch brads. Moving it down on the floor to make it easier to manage, I flush trim it off with my flush trim bit on my router. And that essentially is one unit, but I had to multiply it by two. Now that both units are roughly made, I start trimming up my maple that I'm gonna to use to be the trim that's gonna cover up all those plywood edges. After running each piece on a pass on the joiner, getting one edge perfectly 90 degrees, I have a nice edge to rip up against that table saw fence and to cut this trim to final size. I carefully measure and take each piece to the miter saw to trim it to length. I wanna say something real quick. I make pieces of furniture quite often for people. I have client work, I probably do a project once a month. I don't use any of these fancy woodworking joinery techniques. I don't use mortise and tendon. I don't use any festival dominoes. I don't even use biscuit joints. I use butt joints, brad nails, and glue. And by the time this is all done, anyone who's gonna notice that is gonna be somebody who's in the woodworking field who's gonna say, hey, that wasn't used with fancy techniques, and that's okay. At this point, I'm putting both pieces together and I am so relieved that they fit together perfectly. Here you can see I'm ripping the pieces for the top, but I wanna speak on what I just mentioned earlier. These pieces that I build for people are no way in any shape weak or less quality because I don't use fancy woodworking techniques. The idea here and the purpose of this channel is to show people that woodworking is not as intimidating as you might think. The point of that being that you can make furniture with simple tools, simple techniques that will last a lifetime. Okay, both pieces look good, the top looks good, but I don't have a clamp large enough that's gonna squeeze these pieces together. So here's a little trick. You drill four screws, one in each corner, and then you take a clamp after putting glue in that seam and you clamp those screws together, giving those pieces a very nice tight fit. After that, I'm able to put my other structure in which is gonna essentially hold those two pieces together. A little glue, about eight or nine screws, you're good to go. Now here's the first time I get to see it taking shape. On to cutting the top pieces. What I've done here is I've taken some three quarter inch Baltic birch plywood and I'm layering it out in a brick pattern. Once I like it, I go ahead and make all the pieces I need, laying each piece out staggering as I go all the way down to the end. I'm digging it. Well, now that I have the top all roughed out and the ideas in place, I'm gonna go ahead and trim out the sides of this unit. I take a piece of that hard maple and I'm gonna continue the face frame around this structure at a 45 degree angle. It kind of softens the bend, if you will, as the, the line goes around the edge, giving it a nice reveal. A similar piece of maple cut to length to join it all together at the back of the piece. Okay, it's time for some sanding here. I take some 120 grit sandpaper. However, I'm not just sanding to make things smooth. Now, what I'm doing is I'm putting a slight chamfer on the edges of all of these pieces that are gonna be on the top. And what's that gonna do? Well, it's gonna give each piece a little more of a reveal, giving it kind of a more organic look.
I'm not gonna lie, this process took me a little bit of time, but in the end, it's totally worth it. It just gives it a much more polished, professional look. So I gave the client two options here. I could kind of faux distress the pieces on the top, or I could leave them just plain. They opted to go for the plain look, although it does have some rustic flair because each piece is gonna be brad nailed in at the four corners, giving that little bit of rusticness to the whole thing. I attached this with inch and a half inch brads. I'm not using any glue here. They plan on putting some floating shelves above this. Who knows, if something falls off those shelves and damages one of these pieces, you could just pop it out and replace it. Wouldn't be a big deal. With the flush trim bit still attached to the router, I go ahead and make a pass, making sure the top and the substrate are flush with each other. I flip this beast of a top over, making sure I can go ahead and flush trim these edges, giving me a nice flush surface around the whole top. Well, I gotta do a slight design modification here, but I think it's gonna be for the best. I had to raise the top up off of it about two and a half inches. When the track or the barn door track came in from Amazon, it was a little different than the description had said. So what I had to do was I had to go ahead and raise that top up because as I cut this metal down, I realized that this piece of metal had to be mounted in the face frame that I made out of that maple. By doing so, the hinges that go over the top would be above the surface of the bar. That being said, this modification gave what looked to be a slight reveal underneath the top. Well, here's the sliding door track being mounted on those face frames, and you can see where the hinges would rest. The bar had to be a little higher than that, so I think the modification is going to work out well. After making some cuts and getting these measurements just right, I'm finally finishing putting on the track. Putting a few squeeze clamps to kind of give it somewhere to rest, definitely a good idea. Now I can focus my attention on making the trim for the bar top. Again, just glue and brad nails is all that's needed. Anytime I install a piece of trim that's over 10 feet long like this, I go ahead and clamp it in place as I start to work my way down, brad nailing it in place. It's been a long day. Started about 7.30 this morning. It's now one o'clock in the morning. Uh, raw lumber into this. It's time to go to bed. We'll finish it tomorrow. All right, back at it the next day. I start my morning off by making these barn doors. I go ahead and cut a few pieces to hide those plywood edges. Just gluing them in place, tacking them in place with some brads as well. And there's the simple structure that is the door, of course, times two. As I trim this one inch thick hard maple into one and three quarter inch strips, I go ahead and tack them in place, just using simple butt joints, trimming them as I go. You can always cut a little bit more off, but you can't always add wood too, so be careful in your measurements here. Trial and error is the way to go. Now here comes the process of carefully measuring to give it that nice X look. I'm actually practicing this on a piece of Baltic birch plywood first before I use my more expensive maple. It's just a quick little thing to do, saves a little bit of time just in case I make a mistake. I haven't cut the pieces of expensive wood down to a length that I can't use. Once everything is good to go, I go ahead and transfer those marks to the maple. Cutting them thusly 
so they fit perfectly. Okay, at this point I've taken some blue tape and I've mounted temporarily one of those brackets to the rail. I'm making myself a template here that's going to give me a guide of exactly where to put the door lock and the holes that are going to reference into the door through those hinges. That piece of blue tape at the top of this template is the door lock. I'll explain how those work a little bit later in the video. With the template still attached to the door rollers, I go ahead and mark out my holes that I need to drill. I decided before I attach these rollers to the door, I might as well sand the door up to get a nice smooth feel to it. I drill the holes out according to the guide, and I go ahead and attach a scrap piece to the back of the door. This prevents any blowout or tear out once the brad point bit that I use through the template into the door. Now I got a little problem here. There's a little bit of a gap there that I need to take off with a fortunate bit. So I go ahead and put a quarter inch piece of plywood flush trimmed up to it. As you can see here, it helps the drill bit drill into the material. Once that's removed, I'm good to go and the nut fits right in place. As I start to mount these rollers to the door, I realize that the carriage bolts are too long. So instead of trimming the carriage bolts off, I've taken some washers and made the holes in them a little bit bigger in diameter. So the washers will basically be a spacer underneath, giving the carriage bolt a little less room for these uh, cap nuts to go on properly. You gotta be careful not to strip these out, so I'm gonna go ahead and tighten these down by hand. Okay, all this work for this moment, right? I haven't tested this yet. Here we go. Try it again. Yeah! Yeah, well maybe I'm a little too excited that that worked, but I don't think so. So the door swings freely from left to right over all four channels. I've taken this piece of maple and I've gone ahead and cut it off at a 45 degree at both ends. And I'm going to attach this to the face frame right there in the middle, essentially being a stop block to keep one door from not damaging into the other. Okay, to attach this stop block, I put some wood glue in the middle and I put some CA glue from 2P10 in the corners. I go ahead and spray it with the activator. The CA glue then works as clamps as the wood glue dries and this bond is going to be plenty strong to keep this stop block in place. Okay, now it's the time to install these door locks. They're hand tightened in, so they need to swing freely. Once the door's installed, they're facing outwards. Once they're in, you face them inwards, and it creates a lock to where the door can't be pulled off. I gotta say, at this point, I'm feeling pretty good. The project's coming along nicely. Everything seems to be working very well, and now it's time to put on the coat of stain. Nothing glamorous here. They want a dark kind of espresso color stain. I believe it's called Kona. And I apply it with a rag at first and then I use a chip brush to kind of get inside all the nooks and crannies. Once that stain sets up for about five or 10 minutes, I come back with a clean rag and wipe off the excess. There's no difference here, the process is the same. I take a rag and I flood the surface of the top. But then, since each edge is chamfered, I take a brush and I go in between those layers, making sure that that stain gets permeated through. I wait about 10 minutes and I come back with a dry rag and I wipe the surface clean. And here's the first real look and what the finished product's going to be on this bar top. As far as I'm concerned, coating these inside cabinets with stain was nothing that needed to be filmed. It's 3 a.m., it's time to go to bed and tackle this thing tomorrow. Let's go. With the stain now been dried for a few hours, it's time to put the first coat of polyurethane on. This is a Verithane that I'm using per customer request, and it has a matte finish. The same process is applied to the doors as well. These are a little bit more tricky though. You gotta get in those nooks and crannies. Shouldn't be a big deal though. 
in between coats of urethane, I go ahead and take what they call a Scotch Bright in between coats pad. And believe it or not, that's its name. And then I go ahead and apply the next coat of polyurethane. Now, to give the inside of the cabinet some protection, I use a very thin matte roller and apply a very thin coat of polyurethane a couple of times on the inside. Once I'm finished with that, I use some furniture paste wax on the top. I go ahead and rub that in for a little bit. Once it comes to a little bit of a haze, I don't know, maybe five or 10 minute wait, I take a buffing pad on my orbital sander and buff it clean. Let's talk about details here for a second. Upon removing the blue tape that was protecting this metal from the stain, I noticed some wood grain that was coming through. You have to take care of these details, guys, especially if someone's paying you to make this. These kind of details being taken care of is something they're not gonna notice, and it keeps them giving you good word of mouth in the future. Well, here's the last part of the construction process. I take two panels, I cut them to size, I go ahead and edge band them with a thick piece of maple to give it that same look, these are going to be the shelves that are going to be installed on either side of the refrigerators. My client wanted the shelves to be on either side of where the fridges are going to be kept and then one of those shelves to be modular. So I use my shelf pin jig to do this. I put, simply put a shelf pin in the middle of the cabinet and then one above and below in case they need to adjust them a little bit here or there. Putting those shelf pins in looks like everything's gonna line up just right. That shelf pin jig, man, that thing takes care of accuracy like nobody's business. Again, this is a minor detail, but make sure you stain those freshly drilled holes. If you don't, they'll be hugely noticed. If you do, no one will notice a thing. Sometimes the best work goes unnoticed. Okay, moving on to staining the shelves. There is no difference here. I basically flood the surface and then take a clean rag after about 10 minutes and wipe it clean. Here's a look at the top, guardrail. Oh yeah! <laughs> hey you! <laughs> well, if you had to make it here. Okay. Now you're going back to work. Say okay, bye. Bye. <laughs> Man, I love spending time with her. All right, a quick buffing out of these shelves and we're good to go. Well, here it is in this final form. The challenge now is to get this 30 miles away by myself. Ha! <laughs> All right, let's get to it. This was an absolute blast to build. It's huge. It's absolutely massive. My clients, I want to thank them. Ronnie, Heather, thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to make this for you. I hope you guys get a lot of years out of it. Thank you guys for watching as well. If you liked it, hit that like button for me. Leave me a comment. Let me know what you think. Let me know if you want to try to build one for yourself. Anyway, guys, thanks again for watching. And I'll see you on the next one. Bye.